Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As Pastor Zach mentioned, the message this morning is based on the gospel reading that we heard from Luke chapter 18. We begin with prayer. Lord, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus, our Savior, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, this idea of generosity goes beyond what we do with with our finances. And it really has to do with everything that we have, and I think we could even say everything that we are, using those things in service to, to others. Maybe you remember back last spring when we were introducing our impact ministry campaign to the congregation. We kind of had that that kickoff weekend where we only had one service on Sunday. And then after the service, we broke you out into smaller groups. And we asked different questions for you to answer regarding our ministry here at St. John's. And one of the questions that you were asked was... If St. John's was known as the generous church in the community, what would that look like? And I looked at your answers again just a couple of days ago. Lots of good answers, lots of good suggestions of things that we could do as a congregation to be known as the generous church in the community. They were different answers, but there was really a common thread that ran through all of them. They were all different ways of saying to the community, we are here for you. Or what we have, we share, we want to share with you. That's kind of what I think of it when I think of of generosity. And through this series, we'll be talking about what does that look like, not just as a congregation, but even more specifically as individuals in our daily lives. What does that generosity look like? But first of all, today, we want to focus on how does that generosity happen? Because it doesn't just happen naturally. And it's a lot harder than we may think. We can't just come up with a list of things and and say, let's go do that. If we are to be truly generous toward the people around us, we first need God's generosity toward us. And that's our focus today, that it's God's generosity that leads us to live generously. And Jesus helps us with that, with his story about two men who went to church one day. I was talking to a man the other week, and he was telling me about coming to church here at St. John's and, and what that meant to him. And he said, when I come to church, often I come and I feel empty. But when I leave, I feel full. Jesus' story reminds us that who you will be when you leave worship and what you take away from your time here with God has everything to do with how you come to worship. And today we're asked to consider who we are. The opening confession of sins asked us to think about things that we've done and things that we've failed to do. And that's hard to think about those things. But make no mistake, it's more than just what we do and what we don't do. It's who we are. And the Pharisee in Jesus' story missed that. If you're familiar with with the Gospels and Jesus' ministry as it's recorded in the Gospels, then you're probably also familiar with the fact that he had a lot of run-ins with these people known as the Pharisees. And in fact, some of Jesus' harshest words were reserved for these men. But if you lived in the first century in Palestine and you were just a normal average person, you probably wouldn't have seen them the way that Jesus saw them. That name Pharisee comes from a word that means set apart. And that's what the Pharisees were. 
They were set apart from the rest of society, and they were seen as models of morality. They were regarded as examples of religious fervor. They were passionate about God. They were devoted to the church. They were committed to prayer. They were dedicated to giving offerings. They were staunch about the scriptures. And they were very, very serious fanatics about their faith. And there was a reason why, at one point in his life, the Apostle Paul was proud to be a Pharisee. They were respected by the community, and they were admired for the things that they did. And when you listen to the words of the Pharisee in Jesus' story, you may have noticed that he admired himself, too. And it's not that he was lying. As far as we know, he hadn't robbed anyone, and he didn't actively go out and commit adultery, and he gave more money to the church than almost anyone else. It's not that he was, was lying about those things. It's like he felt like he checked every spiritual box that he needed to. And as a result, he didn't ask for a single thing from God in his prayer. Because as far as he was concerned, he didn't need a single thing from God. Because he was full spiritually. He was full of himself and so his prayer was simple. God, look at me. I'm exactly what you want me to be. Aren't you impressed? But God wasn't. And another man went to church that day, and he was a tax collector. And tax collectors were seen as legalized robbers who got rich off of their own people. Because they worked for the Roman government and they collected taxes from the Jewish people. And the government allowed them to collect more than the actual tax and pocket that for themselves. And so this man, this tax collector, was probably wealthy. He probably lived in a nice house. But he most certainly would have been hated by his fellow Israelites because he worked for the enemy and he got rich in the process. There's only one reason why a Jewish man at that time would sign up to be a tax collector, knowing that he'd be hated by his countrymen. It was greed. And he knew that that was true. And so instead of looking up to heaven and announcing his own righteousness, he could only stare down at the ground. And what sins do you think were running through his mind? Sins that were heavy enough for him to beat his chest in shame. The money that he cheated people out of. The way that he used his position and his power to push people around and get things for himself. The way that he hadn't lived as the believer that he claimed to be. All of those things and many more. Bless you. <laughs> of course, we don't know. Because there's only one thing that the tax collector chose to put into words. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Not a word about what he had done, but simply an admission of who he was. How you go away from worship has everything to do with how you come to worship. The tax collector came to the temple that day, and he was empty. He had nothing to give to God, nothing to offer God. He could only receive from God. And all he asked for was mercy. A word that means not just God feel sorry for me, and help me out of the trouble that I'm in. But it's a word that carries with it the idea of make a sacrifice of atonement for who I am. 
And in asking for atonement, the tax collector was asking God to be generous, to give him a gift that he didn't deserve based on a sacrifice that would make things right. So while the Pharisee boasted about how much God needed him and people like him, the tax collector simply confessed how much he needed God. And while the Pharisee would have looked at the cover of our bulletin today and said, live generously, you bet, yep, that's me, but he would have a hard time going through the confession of sins. The tax collector knew that on his own he was empty and he needed God to fill him up. And that's one of the reasons why we come to worship. To get a true understanding of who we are. And Jesus wants to crush any attitude of being better than others and to crush the lies that we often tell ourselves about our own self-produced righteousness because they're just that, they're lies. And he wants to crush the pharisaical attitude that's in our hearts that live inside of us and beat in our chests. It may not be as obvious as the one in Jesus' story, but it's there. We give voice to it when problems come into our lives and we say a silent prayer to God. Why is this happening? I don't deserve this. It's there. When we tell ourselves, I may have done some bad things, but I'm basically a pretty good person. It's there when we compare ourselves to others who seemingly don't give a rip about God and so we look down on them. Or like the disciples who didn't want to be bothered by the babies. We don't want to be bothered to give our time and our effort and our energy toward people who can't give us anything back. Jesus wants to crush and to kill all of those lies because they take us away from him. Because if my sins aren't that bad, then I don't need a savior that much. And if I'm trusting in my righteousness, well, I'm not going to be trusting in him. And so in his story, Jesus gives us a prayer that's perhaps the best prayer that we ever could pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then he shows us how a loving God responds. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Jesus doesn't argue with the tax collector. He doesn't tell him that he's being too hard on himself. He doesn't excuse his sins. He simply says that this man went home justified, declared innocent, in God's eyes. Because worship isn't just about who we are. It's about who God is. And he's a loving God who has mercy on sinners. And so the Pharisee came to church that day with his own shabby righteousness, which was never going to be enough and he went home with the same. But the tax collector went home with a savior. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We prayed earlier. Extend to me an act of generosity that I definitely don't deserve, but I absolutely need. And what do we find? we find that God is a God who is rich in mercy. A God who says, what I have, I give to you. And I share with you my only son, who is the atoning sacrifice for all of your sins. And it's a promise that he backs up with your baptism, your baptism in his name, where he dressed you in his own righteousness. It's a promise that is supported by the supper that you receive when he comes to you personally 
and he feeds your soul with his forgiveness, and he sends you on your way with his blessing to boot. What we will be when we leave worship has everything to do with how we come to worship. When we come here, we remember that we are sinners, because that's true. And we are absolutely empty on our own. But here is a place where sinners are receivers. And what do you get to take with you when you go home? And what will you be as you go home? You get to take a Savior, and His promise is with you. And when you go home, you will still be a sinner, but not just that, a justified sinner, a sinner forgiven and exalted by your Savior's love. When we were putting together the bulletin for this weekend, under this this theme, Live Generously, Levi Nail, who puts together the bulletin, said, do you have a graphic for that? some kind of an image that we could put on the bulletin cover? And of course I didn't. But now I've I've seen one. I mentioned that shirt earlier at the beginning of the service. If you go out during the time of the gathering and you see one of the the girls wearing that shirt, you'll you'll see a heart on there with a cross superimposed on that heart. When you understand the price that Jesus paid for you, and when you live in the light and the joy of your salvation, and when you are filled up with God's gift of grace, that changes everything about every day. And it changes the way that you look at the people that God places around you in your life. They are not objects to be used for your own ex- own advantage, but rather they are opportunities for your generosity. Overwhelmed by God's grace, we embrace those opportunities for works of love and service to them as we give witness to God's generous gift to us in his Son. It's God's grace that leads us to live generously. Amen.